Hello, welcome. Welcome everyone. We're gonna get started in just a couple minutes. I'm just gonna give it a few um, for everyone to get logged in. And while everyone's getting logged in, if you wanna drop in the chat where you are tuning in from, we always love to see that. Welcome, welcome. Let us know in the chat where you are logged in from. We'll say hi. Michigan. Hi, Cheryl. Laguna Beach, California. Hi, Amy and Peter. Welcome. Sarn Sarnia, Ontario. Hope I'm saying that right. Hi, Jennifer. Texas, Los Angeles. Amazing. Valley Springs. Wonderful. Very exciting. Seattle, yay. Portland, yay. Reading, Pennsylvania. All right. Hello from Connecticut, Colorado. Wow, such a great crowd from all over today. We love to see that. Um, we can go ahead and get started. Welcome. Thank you so much for tuning in today. We are here to celebrate this beautiful book, Love and Lemons, Simple Feel-Good Food by Janine D'Onofrio. And we have got Camille Stiles as well to chat with us. And we're just so excited to welcome both of these two. Um, I'll introduce myself. I'm Zoe Friesen. I'm the events manager here at Book Larder. We are a community cookbook store located in Seattle, Washington. We do 100% food writing and cookbooks. And we love getting to chat with um, food writers and cookbook authors like Janine. Um, so let's see, just wanna go over a couple things before we get started and then I'll let these two take it away. Um, we host a lot of in-person events and classes as well as these virtuals. Um, of course, we've done more virtuals over the last few years um, and it's such a joy to be able to connect with um, authors and interviewers from all around, all around the country and the world, and of course, um, audience members as well. So thank you so much, everyone, for being here with us this evening. Um, okay, let's see, uh, what do I have to share with you? So the talk will be recorded and it will be shared on our YouTube channel within about 48 hours. So if you need to jump off at any point, just know that um, it will be available to rewatch. You can always send the link to a friend. Um, so that will be there for you. I do have the live transcript of the captions turned on. So if you want to see those or don't want to see those, you can control that at the bottom of your screen there. And then let's see, um, Janine and Camille will be chatting and then they will also be taking questions towards the end. So if you have any questions for them, go ahead and put those in the Q&A box down at the bottom of your screen so that Camille can see those. Um, you're welcome to chat with each other, chat with me, use the chat as much as you'd like. Um, but for your questions, uh, go ahead and use that Q&A box and that would be fantastic. Um, thank you so much to everyone who has already purchased a copy of the book from us. We really appreciate it. And I will go ahead and drop a link in the chat um, to those of you who have not had a chance to purchase it yet. And we will make sure that you get your copy. Um, all right. Well, without further ado, I will go ahead and turn it over to Janine and Camille. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Hi. Thanks, Zoe. It's great to see everyone here. Um, so happy that we can gather this evening and celebrate Janine's book. And I know I have so many questions for her tonight. So um, Janine, you want to say hi, and then we'll dive right into it. Hi, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate it. And thank you for supporting the book. And I'm so happy to have this chat. Thank you so much for coming. All right, so like Zoe said, I'm Camille, and um, I actually have the privilege of knowing Janine way back in the day. We were actually just reminiscing about the fact that we actually met um, over a decade ago when we had both just started our blogs, which were very much side hustles while we were working full-time in other industries. Janine was a very talented designer here in Austin, where I still live. Um, and I remember being really amazed when I stumbled upon her blog she was working on, because I could tell then 
she really had an incredible point of view and was such a talent even back in the early days of blogging um, when things were much, much different. So it's been such a pleasure to just watch her now from afar, since she no longer lives in Austin, um, just really grow her career and share her point of view and her incredible recipes with literally millions of people every single day. Um, so it's really exciting to now come back together for this, um, the launch of her newest cookbook, Simple Feel Good Food. Um, I have my copy. I got an advanced copy that I've been cooking out of nonstop. And I can say that it definitely is one of those rare books that is not only beautiful and inspiring, but one where I want to make everything. And I think that's, I'm sure a lot of you guys who are big Love and Lemons fans would agree that I think that's really one of Janine's, like her secret sauce is that she somehow manages to make the most beautiful recipes so incredibly simple with not too many ingredients and the things that you really do just want to make night after night after night. And um, I'm going to really let her dig into what makes this new book different and what the point of view and inspiration was behind it. But I will just say that whether you need to get dinner on the table fast because you've had a crazy day at work or you know you have a busy week ahead and you want to plan in advance and know that you need to have dinner ready to go, like this book has got you across all of those different realistic life situations that we all run into. So Janine, I'd love to just kind of start there with knowing you have written so many recipes on the website and in your previous book. Um, what was really the inspiration behind this book? Like why, why did you need to write another one and what makes this book different? Yeah. Um, so I've, thank you so much. What is such a nice intro. I'm so flattered. Um, so I started Love and Lemons way back in 2011, like Camille said, um, the, like the wild, wild west, the beginning of blog sort of that we were just talking about. And I think I've been, and I contributed to Camille's site meal and with us like a farmer's market seasonal um weekly recipe and um since then like that many years I've written like a lot and lots of recipes and have had just so many conversations um so many people and so many readers and I get I get a lot a lot of feedback and I realized for this book that um I felt like I had people that were from two distinct perspectives. There are people or people that would respond to a recipe that could be made with kind of minimal ingredients right now and was quick to get on the table. So those were the recipes that people I'd hear like, oh, I had everything to make this. So I went and made it. Or, and then I had this other camp of people that like to, they're like, how can I freeze this? How can I meal prep this? Like, what can I make ahead? And so that was really the inspiration behind this book um, and why I felt like a third one, this is the third book, um, was, I, I just like that. I, I liked the challenge of how can I kind of get in the minds of both? Because for me, I started when I started way back when um, I was very much like on the fly. I shopped at the farmer's market. I got my CSA. I lived in Austin. I got my CSA box and I love to cook with vegetables and I love to come home and just make what I had and fast forward all these years. We have a two-year-old now and it's crazy. So now I find like a meal prepping a little bit more. So the book is divided into two categories or two sections. Let me just kind of find the the intro. So what type of cook are you? The first section is called at the ready. These are the recipes that you can make like right now, come home and make right now. They're very pretty straightforward. And then the section two is in advance. And those are great for meal prep. So, and then, oh, and then the whole book. I forgot. So those are the two sections. And then every chapter is um, breakfast, salads, soups, dinners, desserts are divided that way. So like for example, breakfast, it has quick weekday breakfast and meal prep breakfast. So that's like, that's throughout the whole book. So it's really just was based on 
like, I don't know, years and years of feedback. So I hope it's, I just hope it's helpful. Yeah, I love that. It's kind of, I, this is something I think about a lot because I think that there really is a place for that, like on the fly cooking and a busy lifestyle. But likewise, if you love to cook and you love to eat and get good meals on the table, there are those days when you want to have that meal prep so that you're preparing yourself to be able to get a meal together really quickly on the fly. So I love that combination because it really does feel so accommodating to every different kind of season of life. And, you know, even, even your moods, like there are Sundays where I just like would love nothing more than to get in the kitchen and spend a couple hours meal prepping. And there are other Sundays where like, I want to go swimming and be outside and I don't want to be in the kitchen. And I know that those weeks I need to prepare to be able to make some quick meals at the end of the day quickly. So um, this book really does kind of have you covered for both scenarios. Yeah. And I tried to, I, I feel that way too. I, I, like I said, I, I find that now I toggle back and forth and sometimes it's like as simple as I have a sauce prepped. So like in this grain bowl section, there's like prep a grain, prep a sauce, prep, um, yeah, prep um like a, a protein and maybe I roast the vegetable I like I roast the vegetable when I'm ready to, to cook so it's you know 20 or 30 minutes or whatever to roast the vegetable but I at least it's not as daunting on those crazy days when I have like a, the sauce is ready to go and the, mm -hmm. like the components are kind of ready to go in the fridge um or it's yeah some and and I love like Camille I know like you have a similar approach where you do like a dressing and like a roasted sweet potato and that's your meal prep strategy so that and that helps um yeah yeah and I think it also sparks that inspiration on nights when you just can't think of what to cook because like right now I have a really delicious peanut sauce in my fridge so I'm like what am I going to make with peanut sauce? Because I want, like, it's so delicious. Like I don't want it to go to waste. And it's using that as almost like the beginnings of that spark of inspiration of like, what would be a delicious, satisfying dinner tonight? Right. Cause it could go over a vegetable and it can go over noodles or like dip in spring roll or something like that. Um, yeah, that's like, I, I find that when I at least have something going, <laughs> that's like, those are, and sometimes it's like those weeks where I feel like I'm setting myself up for success that week. And, and, you know, in others, it's just, it's summer and I'm, I went to the farmer's market and I'm like, I, I'm just going to like go with what I have because everything's so fresh and, um, you know, I want to enjoy the time in the kitchen with a glass of wine cooking. I'm curious. Um, now you mentioned that now that you have a kid meal prep is more, a more regular part of your life. What does, what are the things that you meal prep the most? Would you say? Um, I would say. Well, I would say like a sauce um, or, and I also like to use, a fr like really use the freezer too. Like um, there are a few sort of like, um, like here are these breakfast freezer burritos that actually he really does. I eat them for lunch, but I, he likes them too. He's two. So it's sort of like what he likes one day to like, who knows if he likes it the next day, but um, like these are for they're for breakfast, but like they're these curried lentil freezer burritos um, with kale. Oh, I eat those and, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Yeah. Um, so I like, I have a stash of those in my freezer right now. Um, that's like um, something that I like to prep ahead. Um, and then let's see, I have, um, what was I going to say? I just lost my train of thought. Um, the, oh, this is like lasagna section so I like to design um I have this like chart so at the end of every chapter there's this is in the in advance at the end of the in advance chapter so no so I have this lasagna chart which is oh, I've got it sorry oh you're so much better um so I thought uh so this is at the end of the dinner section. There's a, at the end of the dinner section and it's a graphics chart where, so I thought like, um, so these freeze well, let me get back to the question. These freeze well and we, we they're all tested to go in the freezer. So it's like, that's like an example of something I can pull out. 
Um, and then if this, uh, the way I really like to meal prep though, is where I make this, is this three in one section? This is sort of like the heart. Um, this is meal yes, prep. This really spoke to for, me. Yeah, this is like for meal prep. I call it for meal prep for people who don't like to eat the same thing every day. So the idea is you start with a star vegetable, like this is zucchini, um, because I think in the summer, it's a common problem where everybody has all this zucchini going on and like need everybody needs an idea to use up your garden zucchini. And um, so the idea is there's a grocery list here and then you make three recipes. There, there, it's a three-day meal plan. So there's one res recipe one, recipe two, and recipe three. And one recipe, like these stuffed zucchini boats, um, turn into like you scoop the middles out, and the middles is this like farro stuffed zucchini, and then the middles become this creamy sauce. They blend into this creamy pasta sauce with sauteed zucchini on the second night. So then, like the idea is that one recipe's components work into the next, work into the next. And at the end of the week, like when you have um, zucchini and herbs and this sauce you made earlier, they go onto this flatbread. So the idea is that like, this is how I, I cook most of the time is that you start with one, like I make something and then I'll have like bits and bobs of the, that leftover or extra of that ingredient. So, so then I designed these three, this section to like accommodate, well, it's just how I think, how I think of cooking is. Like I have that sauce from yesterday and now what can I turn it into the, to the next recipe? And then also use up everything that I had that made the first recipe, but like spin it slightly different for the second recipe and then spin it slightly different for the third recipe. And then like after that, that there are like, they're kind of based on star vegetables because like I said, I love vegetables and season and cooking with the seasons. And, um, like this is a whole, uses a whole head of cabbage because I feel like that's an impossible task. <laughs> like you buy a cabbage and use a little bit to make a slaw. And then what do you do with the rest? It goes to waste. Like you throw it away. You forgot about it. But um, this three in one uses, utilizes a whole head of cabbage from recipe one to recipe two, recipe three. And it's not like you ate the same thing every day. So that's like how I, how I like to cook. And I think that's, so you kind of prepped on day one, but then, then you're ahead, like I said, on day two and day three. Um, I needed that chapter. I, this, I need the cabbage chapter right now. I actually had a dinner party two nights ago and I ordered, I did a grocery order. And instead of radicchio for my salad, the shopper brought me like the biggest head of red cabbage. <laughs> Which Great. is fine. It worked fine in the salad, but now I have seven eighths of a red cabbage left. And I like, keep trying, and I hate waste. I like to yep. use every bit of every vegetable in my fridge. So I feel like all week, I'm just like basically spending my week trying to find ways to use cabbage. So I'm particularly Great. excited about this chapter. Um, and just so you guys can see, like for a hint of that chapter, because you might be thinking cabbage is maybe not the most exciting vegetable, but seared cabbage wedges that have this amazing green harissa and then nachos would you have thought to make pita nachos with cabbage because I didn't um and then these chickpea tacos with pickled cabbage and so it's like if you're going to go to the trouble of pickling cabbage use it more than once and use it in a way that's really delicious I love that yeah and I think also seared cabbage I think cabbage is also kind of an underrated vegetable it's so affordable and humble and yet like not everyone's eating it all, all the time or you're just like making a slaw out of it. But um, but I love to pick, like I love to pick up actually a lot of things. I'll pickle red. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously I pickle red onions, but I guess like to answer the previous question before, like starting with a pickle, <laughs> like a sauce of pickle, so many meals can go from there because yeah. you have this balance of like a creamy, you know, a creamy, flavorful, saucy something, a pop of flavor from some kind of pickle. But I, anyway, I hope, I hope you like the cabbage recipes. I, I'll, I'll report back. I'm sure they're more creative than what I had in my mind, which was like too many cabbage salads. 
We'll try, awesome. like, try the searing the cabbage wedges though. It's like, if, it, if you haven't done that or it's, it uses like most of it. Like, cause it you shrinks have, down. Well, cause oh. like you, it, cause you need like enough for, oh my gosh, right. Sorry. It's like loud upstairs. The kid's taking a bath. Um, <laughs> <laughs> like you need to sear a whole chunk of it. And then you put it um, on the, like on, in a cast iron skillet or in a grill pan and, um, and it becomes like soft and caramelized and like mm. you go until it's almost even kind of burnt, but it becomes sweet and just tender until it's like knife and fork, you can eat it. Um, yeah. And then slather it with sauces um, and herbs. And, and then we, I have it on like a base of hummus. So it's sort of like a composed vegetable main dish. And that like, that's like half the cabbage and then the rest, you know, the rest is pickled. So anyway, that's my hot tip of like, <laughs> you like really using it up and, yeah. and not just using like a tiny amount. I love that. Okay. I'm trying it for sure. That sounds delicious and like genuinely satisfying too. Yeah, and it's a little really more easily digestible than a lot of raw cabbage. <laughs> Totally. Yeah. It's really, really good. Super cooked. I love Carmen's question that she just dropped in the Q and a, um, she asked, what was your first go-to recipe that you still make from the book? Um, let's, uh, well, I have, gosh, that's a big, I think I still have so much of this, like in my freezer. Um, the go-to recipe that I still make is, um, I make, well, all of these sauces from the, the green, I make this all the time, this lentil salad with this green tahini sauce, because I, um, and you can use any herb. So this is like a, the sauce, if you have mint or dill or tarragon, like it's a great base for whatever herb you're growing. If you have too many herbs in your herb garden, uh, this tahini sauce is my go-to, is my go-to. I, I probably always have a tahini green sauce on hand mm -hmm. and I love that it's versatile and can, well, kids here now. I love that as an alternative too. I feel like whenever I, right now I'm, I'm in my first spring crop of my vegetable garden and most of what I have is a ton of herbs, which I love, um, because yeah. I love cooking with herbs, but I feel like everyone is just like make pesto, make mint pesto, make basil pesto. And I love all of those, but I love the idea of the green tahini because, you know, you can only deal with so much pesto. You can only so, eat. So yeah. Much of it. Yeah. I love that. Um, well, and I love a pesto every way too. I, that was the first book was like pesto in many ways. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I could have done like green. Well, I didn't need to do chart of it because I just think you, any herb you have goes into it, to it. And I love like, if you're not doing dairy or something like that, tahini is just like such a wonderful, creamy, even if you are doing dairy, but like you should also have um, tahini in your life, I feel mm -hmm. like. And then this one, this is like what I'm into right now, this creamy orzo with asparagus and peas, because this is the asparagus here is, it's this, this season here, it's really good. Mm -hmm. And it has this creamy base of, um, it's, it's a, like a, a risotto sort of um, with orzo. So the orzo, the pasta releases the starches and there's actually no cream in it or, or cheese or anything. It's totally vegan, but, um, and then I pile it with the fresh green vegetables and then I shower it with my hair. Um, no, I shower it with herbs <gasps> and, and I just love using fresh herbs that way. So that's like another thing I have going on around here and our yeah. kid loves it too. He loves the orzo. I'm curious too, just personally for, for the people on who have been following Love and Lemons for years, which I'm sure there are many, many of you, are there any like old school recipes from the blog that you still make a lot? Like ones that you made like way back in the day? Um, let's see. Well, my, um, I only think it's hard to answer this question because like, yes, like, but I don't, read the recipe if that makes sense right. <laughs> I have things that I make all the time and it's like there is a recipe for it but I don't like go find it I just like yeah, you like tweaked and evolved them probably too I'm sure it's like always changing well or like if I'm cooking at home and not without a, testing anything it's just free cooking like I don't I just eyeball all this stuff I don't measure anything but um, like there's a tomatillo salsa that's actually like on top right now that I make. It's my go-to tomatillo salsa. I make that all the time. Um, what are like the old, I'd have to scroll down. What's like so old. I'll tell you that my sister and her husband like have 
they make like the oldest, oldest OG stuff. And I'm like, I have a new recipe for this. And they're like, oh, you like the one from 10 years ago. I'm like, but really the new one, like you should give it a try. Um, I know. It's always funny when people like, I'm sure you have this experience all the time, but when people mention to me that they like make a recipe all the time and I literally have to stop and think like what it even is because it's so old. I, like I have to remember it. That happens, but you know what? I think I remember way back, this is something I make all the time, but when it's summer and these are my favorite combination of ingredients. And I feel like you had something like this too. Or when we met, it was like, there was like a peach salad with arugula, like mozz, like fresh, either fresh mozzarella or like burrata or something like that and mm -hmm. lemon. Um, I feel like that's like something I make. That's something I know I post. I posted a lot of arugula salads because I love arugula and a lot of like beautiful salads like that. And I feel like, um, yeah. I feel like you always post really beautiful salads too. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, peaches and burrata always have a place in my life. That's one combination that will never get old. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, it's, it's always good with some basil. Do you have any other, I, I know you mentioned a couple, but maybe we haven't really talked about desserts yet. Do you have a favorite dessert from the book? Um, yes, these, these carrot cake, well, I, okay, I have two, but these carrot cake bars, we've had these on repeat a lot. Yeah. Um, so this is like, we all love carrot, we love carrot cake here. Um, my husband is obsessed with carrot cake. He has it for his birthday every year. And, but this is like a sort of a raw vegan treatment where the bottom layer is cash, like a pulse it in a food processor. It's like um, carrots, medjool dates, uh, walnuts, coconut, cinnamon, and then it has like a creamy blended, like if you blend it in the Vitamix, it gets really creamy. Um, it's like, like a cashew frosting with maple syrup. So this is like a healthy dessert that I like to have in the freezer. And actually when I make them, I hide them in the freezer. <laughs> Like I'm honestly blown away at the ingredients. Like this is legit healthy. It's not just like a lighter version. It's like actually healthy. I mean, it's yeah. the ingredients, dates, carrots, coconut, walnuts. It's like, there's nothing in it, but healthy nourishing ingredients. I actually might make this literally when we get off the call. <laughs> yeah. I think that was the first when uh, coming up with the idea of feel good food and trying to think of healthy and also meal prep things so what they have to freeze. Mm -hmm. um ahead of time but you, you can keep them in the freezer for you know forever and they're creamy and and really kind of satisfying and we love them talk to me about the no bake avocado tart yum I feel like that feels so seasonal for right now um yeah that's it's really good it, this combines my I I feel like it's like an to me, it's sort of like a non-dairy, it's like, it's between like a key lime pie and a cheesecake, but there's no dairy. There's a graham cracker crust. So it feels indulgent. Oh, and I, I have a hot tip on this one because um, if you don't have a tart, like it's when I made this the, a few weeks ago and, but I didn't feel like putting, put like um, pressing the crust into the tart pan and everything. And like, if you don't have a tart pan, um, I made it as a parfait. So I took like the graham cracker crust at the bottom, like I pulsed it together, put it in a glass and made the creamy avocado filling. And I just, I, I just put it in a glass and I kept the components in the fridge and I just assembled one whenever I wanted. And I actually kind of, like that one. For, this is like, if you're hosting, like yeah. this is like an impressive, bring it out and slice it. But I was just making it to, like, cause I craved it and I had it in the fridge and it was just easy to, to put together. And there's so much lime juice in the avocado filling that it, it like lasted a few, really a few days, which is surprising because it is avocado, but it was delicious for like, even like maybe up to four or five days. Yum. Okay. That could definitely be breakfast too. I'm just saying. Yeah, it was good. And then I think like, and if you don't, even if like, just as an idea, if, if you don't like do the graham crackers, you could do like the walnut crust or something at the bottom of the parfait, not the tart. Yeah. I was thinking about, um, one of my team members is allergic to gluten, dairy and eggs. 
And they're so it's dessert and she loves dessert. And it's always hard for me to think of desserts to make for her that aren't like sorbet, you know? Yeah. And I feel like so many of these would work for someone who's obviously vegan or just with her particular dietary restrictions, which can be tricky with desserts because so many desserts have either dairy or eggs. It's hard sometimes to come up with ones that don't have either one. Yeah. I like to have a a mix and like include really a lot of non-dairy stuff because I find that's like what I eat more like the every day. Like there's Mm -hmm. indulgent dessert that's sometimes, and then there's, um, something like this freezer fudge chart, like this is a great non-dairy. So I have this chart that starts with like a a base recipe for freezer fudge and this uses, oh, but it has nuts, but there's one that is made with tahini. And I have to say that that was my favorite one, this tahini pistachio coconut one um, has, has like it has pistachios on top, and then inside it's tahini and ground ginger. So it's like, and the ingredients are maple syrup, coconut, vanilla, and just the ginger with the tahini that gave it like this um, tahini, I think is like, has a nice savory flavor. So it had a nice balance of like sweet and savory. And with the pistachios and shredded coconut on top, like that's what I would recommend for another like dairy-free, even nut-free one. Mm, that sounds so good. And you can put, cut them into little squares and feel like you're going to get a little indulgent thing out, but like, but then I like, I'll go back again and again. <laughs> I'd love to hear, I always love hearing about like the adventures of developing a cookbook because I know it is, it is no joke. It's a huge job. It takes so much time to develop every recipe and write and the editing process and promoting it. It is such a labor of love. Um, Will you share a little bit about just the rest, I guess the cookbook development process with us? What was it like? Were there any major challenges or even like kitchen fails that happened along the way? Um, yeah, so I, well, I started this one about three years ago. It wow. was during the pandemic. I had a lot of extra time and had a lot of time alone. And, and also everybody was cooking lot then so I that's when I like I said I got a lot of the feedback and everything but um you know I start with some ideas or I start with well I start with um actually it starts with like a recipe that gets made that I'm like I it's so good that I feel like I want to save it for the next book and that's like the danger zone because then it's like oh we're gonna go again because this recipe <laughs> is so good and like it deserves a spot like <laughs> in a book and that one was it was something I just kind of threw together and then I was surprised how good it was and this involves one of your favorite ingredients I know let me find it (laughs) these sweet potato veggie burgers yeah I know you love a sweet potato oh I sure do I just ate one right before this call (laughs) (laughs) and these are um, sweet. It's a sweet potato paneer burger. So it's sort of like curried spices. There's cardamom, cumin, and this paneer is in it. Although we have a totally tested a vegan version too. So it was it was it's great. Also without the paneer, the paneer just is something a little, little extra. But um, so I start. So I made these, and I and I was obsessed with them, and then. So it was like, okay, what is happening for the book? And then I thought, then I, and I had this also this three in one idea of like the thing about the three in one section, the recipe that works one into the next to the next is it's hard to do on a, like a blog post where you're like scrolling and going down um, because it needs to be like designed, like the layout. Like it needs to be in a layout that, and I need to be able to tell the story that's like, like from this recipe to this recipe, to this recipe. And like, there's little notes. So it's like, this is this, um, this is the rice section, like make a batch of rice. And for on the first day you make these veggie sushi burritos and there's a sauce that goes with it. And then, and this like turmeric tofu that goes in the middle. And then the turmeric tofu from day one crumbles 
into this cilantro um, fried rice, which like then the tofu is kind of the egg, it's yellow and it's like, instead of the egg, not that like I am fine with eggs, but I like tofu too. Um, and then anyway, and then it goes into this, like everything in the end goes into a big soup. But so the process is, I guess it's, it's all over the place until it comes together, like to an idea. And then um, an idea of like what recipes kind of fit together as a, a or what do I want to make most? Like, what am I craving? And then, um, and then once I kind of map something out for maybe months, um, then I start or testing, like I start testing things here and there. And then like, we really get going and we test sometimes like seven recipes in a day. And it's just, we're eating, living, um, everything so much. And then there's like, we'll test a vegan version, but the, the worst, well, the worst thing to ever be made was in this lentil section, there's a such same thing as lentils, like pot of lentils, um, which I love. And then there are three recipes that use the lentils. And at the end of this one, well, it's, it has this like, I'm sorry, I'm all over the place. It has this sort of like Mediterranean flair to it now. It has tomatoes and the stuffed tomato recipe and other things, but we started kind of with like a Mexican-ish route where it ends with this like lasagna, which is, we started with this Mexican-ish route. So it was like lentils as like a taco meat kind of thing, which I've done before. But then I took like the lentil taco meat thing and we made this enchilada sort of bake. And it was I, the worst thing ever come out of my kitchen ever. It was mushy. And like, oh. it was just, it was mushy, <laughs> it, was, oh. it was terrible. But like what happened from that is then I had scrapped three recipes and started over. And then we ended oh. up with actually this lentil skill lasagna is the third recipe in the series. Once I kind of switched to like this, um, I don't know, more just like Italianish kind of thing. And this is like a very hearty, there's no meat and the lentils make, it comes together in one pot so like you cook the noodles in the sauce and the lentils go in and it's so simple by the time you get to recipe three and then like on the topic of lasagna not that like I hope you don't think the whole book is lasagna but um, <laughs> that lasagna chart that I talked about before was I thought like okay we have this lasagna chart and, and I, there's one for every there's a lasagna for every season so I think like why make just kind of a boring tomato lasagna when you can have um, like a, the spring one is like pesto and peas and spring vegetables and the summer one is eggplant and tomatoes and I'm it again and the uh, fall one has this butternut this like dairy free butternut squash sauce that oh my gosh um that goes over everything. And then the winter one, go in the wrong direction. Okay. So these lasagnas, so there's one for every season. Cause I think there you know, are four bit basic seasons and this is how I like to change up to something. But we also tested, a lasagna is like a big thing to begin with. And yeah. at the time we didn't even, I don't need, well, we had, um, and they were just like, like, we're two, we're two people. And, um, <laughs> and, um, and then, well, and then like, and then Phoebe, my co-author, she, um, like whatever, we're, there's only so much lasagna people can eat, but, um, <laughs> this has, <laughs> yeah, so, but, but we have we made a fruit, we tested every version to be vegan and we tested every, we tested every version to begin with multiple times to get like nail the original version. And then we went, took another pass to test the a vegan version. And then we took another pass to test a freezer friendly version because well, like it has to freeze, right? For even in the middle of winter and you need to pull, people are coming over and you need to pull a lasagna out of um, the freezer. So, I mean, this is four times however many we, you know, we ate like 30 lasagnas, which is a lot for anybody. And um we've eaten a lot of lasagna and I think we couldn't look at lasagna for a year after that. That's a lot. But, um, you know, I love the lasagnas for, that's going to be my go-to for when I need to take dinner to someone. 
because yeah, I feel totally. like lately I've been in, in a situation where, you know, I've signed up to take a, a friend who just had a baby. I'm taking her dinner and I want to take a sick friend dinner. And my days have been so busy that like, I really have been scrambling to get dinner together in time to like, take it to another person's house. And I want to be that person that has the lasagna in my <laughs> freezer already ready to yeah. take it out and take to my friends. Like I'm going to be that person. That's yeah. So yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. And it's like one and done, you make a salad, boom. Uh-huh. Okay. Before we get to questions, I'm going to spring a little rapid fire on you. You know, I had to do it. Um, okay. I've got a few, so don't overthink it. Just go with first thing that comes to mind. You know, I love my cookbooks. Janine told me the other day that I'm like more obsessed with cookbooks than any person she knows. And it's true. Um, so I'd love to hear what is a cookbook that you love to cook out of. That's not your own. Oh gosh. Um, I love, um, oh my gosh, it's called now it's losing my, well, I love plenty like Odalangi's cookbooks and I really love the newest one. Um, the, not the newest one, the second to the, um, the quick one, the simple. Um, yes. I know exactly which one you're talking about. Yes. It's or in the, in the shelf, yeah. the shelf love series. I love the shelf love series ones. Yeah. It's, it's just simple is the name of there's flavor. Well, there's, and yeah. There's simple. And then the, what was well, What's the one is orange is the shelf. I have it over there. The, the shelf. Cook. There's one called the cookbook. Plenty flavor, Jerusalem, simple. It's this one, shelf love. Oh, I've never seen that one. Yeah. And then this, and this extra good things. Actually, I really, no, I really love this one because it's based on like, um, like a component, like a pickle and, and and it's not all just like, I, like you, I kind of get in the pesto rut too, or like, oh, I made a sauce and there is like a sauce thing, but, um, um, there's also just other components, other sort of pickled and, or it's like a topping or a spice blend or something. And they're all things that I like never think of. So whenever I'm like wanting to try, like if I'm having family, like not, if I'm having somebody over that I know is kind of like an adventurous um, like someone who's going to willing to try, to try anything likes everything, then that's uh, like, I'm usually just picking things out of one of those cookbooks because then it's like, I wouldn't have thought to make this and yeah. so delicious. Love that. Okay. What are five things we'd always find in your fridge? Lemons, um, almond milk, tahini, uh, and like some kind of like Greek yogurt, uh, mm. And like maybe pecorino cheese. Mm. Good, good, good. Okay, last one. Um, this is my favorite question. It's a little morbid, but what would you eat for your last meal? Oh gosh, um, my last meal would be like, hmm, <laughs> like probably. What would my last? It depends on the season, you know. I get so like stuck in like what I'm feeling like right now. Um, but like, then there's something go to, like, it's probably like a Vietnamese, like noodle bowl. There's a place, um, either like, I like either Elizabeth's or there's, um, a truck in Austin that's called Saigon Lavender. And I love their tofu noodle bowl and the sauce that's on it. And like, it's like my last meal is, would also be like my everyday meal. (laughs) Yeah, the thing I could eat, like the, maybe the thing I could literally eat every day that I would never get, like I never get tired of those flavors with, like basil and mint and something like fresh like that. With that means you're living right if you're eating your last meal every day. <laughs> and I, I do feel like those are things too that sometimes they're not always the easiest to replicate, like those exact flavors at home. So it's fun to get those um, from like the places that really do it right. Yeah. Okay, let's see. We've got a couple of questions. Cheryl asked if there's some way that she could get nutrition information for any of the recipes in your cookbook. Um, you know, I don't post nutrition information because um, I like it's not how it's not how I eat. I um, I I don't like count 
um, calories or anything like that. I just kind of eat mindfully, but um, there is like always an online calculator from like my fitness pal that, um, that you can plug the ingredients into and get the nutrition information. And Katie asked, um, comparing your process as, as you've gone through the cookbook development process three times now, um, was this, was creating this book more or less stressful or more fun? How would you compare this process to the others? Um, gosh, well, it's, I think it's been the longest one in the works um, and probably the most work. I think they're similar, like they're similar, it's similar compared to like, well, I know like what I'm doing, like I know what's ahead and what's expected kind of, but like, it's just really long no matter what. <laughs> but um, I love like coming up with the, like, I love figuring out like a concept and how that all puzzles together and how this group of recipes relates to each other. And then like how I can like also very visually get the information across because I think like designing something into like a chart or um, something like that, I think it's like, it's how my brain thinks, which is like, I see like things in puzzles and pictures. So I hope that's helpful, but Oh, the question was, how is this, was this process easier? I thought it would, you know, I, I think it's going to be easier every time. Um, and then you get to the the middle and the end and, you know, it's just like, but then the, like the end part is like the middle is like, Oh, inspiration. We're going, we're going, we're going. And then the end is like, okay, well, here are all the failures and here are like the ones that need like to, we need maybe a new idea over here, but I try not to like re like redo some like not have like like what vegetable hasn't been shown here or what type of food is it here like what we're, what, what we're not just repeating the same things so at the end it's kind of a puzzle and then and then the end I'm just at the end end not the end end the three quarter way through then. The, the answer is like, I'll work to the time that I have. And until then, like, I'll keep changing, changing and iterating, iterating to just like, try to make it every recipe as tested as possible and as good as possible. And like, as worthy of a spot as possible. And like, really, it's just like, you have to take it away before I'm like, okay, like, I'll just keep changing, changing, changing. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. That's what makes you so, good. Um, so yeah, it's, so it's a lot of work and I, and I'm excited that, you know, it, it's, it's out finally and, um, you know, and, and I, I'm proud of it. It was like, it's, it's, it's like fun and it's a lot of work and it's obviously like I've done it three times. So I enjoy it. Yeah. It feels really fresh, which is not easy to do when you've shared as many recipes online and in books as you have. So you definitely accomplished that. Well, and I like to, and, and like every recipe in the book, I don't, it's, it's like, it's new to the book. It's not just, it's not from the blog. So, you know, yeah, I sort of try to make sure there's everything's a little, like a little bit, everything's pretty different. Okay. I love Natalie's question. She wants to know if you were to give advice to someone who would like to write a cookbook, what would your advice be? Um, gosh, well, I guess. Um, well, well, here's my best advice. You have to put things in the book that you really, really want to eat a lot. So that's like the true test, right? Is, um, like how many times, like I'm going to eat this 30 times until I better like it because <laughs> it's like, not just like I had this and it was fine or whatever. It's like, you I'm really, you're really committing to the, to the group and you're going to be with them for a really long time. And, you know, even afterward, you're going to like make videos and promote it and everything and like have everything again and again and again. And, um, but so I don't know, does, is that like an okay tip that like is the tip I like that helps me or, or I guess doesn't help me, but, but that's like the truth, the truth of it. Um, and I think just like, carefully testing the recipes and maybe coming up with like a plan it's like I try to come up with as strong of a plan at the beginning that stays within the framework so that by like three years later I'm not just like 
oh, I'm just changing my mind for no reason. I can kind of go back to like the core like framework that was there because things like will change, like the whole list plan from the beginning won't be the end. Like I can go, I, it, it won't be exactly the same at the end because there are things that didn't work and, or things that, or, or sometimes there are things that like, it didn't work, but I set it aside. And then like at the end, it's like, then it got brought back. Like a, then we figured it out by the end in a different way. And then it fit back in, if that makes sense. Or if I'm just talking um, in circles, but um, yeah. So I think like trying to like be really true to the, like, or, or try to be true to like the framework of the concept of the book. And then I try to be true to like, what's the love and lemons recipe, you know? Mm -hmm. And it And it's not like, it's fresh. It has herbs. It has like, like if not lemons, like something citrusy or vinegary, um, and, and bright. So like sometimes it's just when you're trying to think of something new, I try to just think of like, well, what's the love and lemon spin on it? So like, what's your own like personal like what like I don't know list of like core beliefs that you have to come back to when you're kind of feeling like ah mm -hmm. yeah I feel like great advice for like any creative project even you apply that your vision and making sure that you're staying true to your unique point of view and making sure before you launch something it's something that you're going to love and want to be in bed with for years to come so <laughs> I think that's really great advice for anyone thinking about launching any creative project. Um, okay, Carmen would like to know if there was a recipe that didn't make it into the book that you wish you could have. Um, yes, and if you, so you can have these because they're not there, but we had, if you like write me, um, we had did this pre-order after, like this pre-order book bundle, the pre-order is done, the book's already out. But like we did five bonus recipes like at the like um as just like a bonus recipe ebook and which we figured out a few of those recipes few were like just from the scrap scrapping like they didn't fit in the book or they didn't have a place in the book but then like a few were like there's this cauliflower parmesan recipe that started as like a cauliflower um like pizza bake sort of like what we call it we had like a pizza a spice we were calling it a cauliflower pizza bake and it was like a bread and baked cauliflower sort of cutlet that was going to be a sheet pan meal and it it was a, like it was work it was working but it was just it didn't make the cut and then it came back later for like the bonus recipes as this like baked cauliflower parmesan dish which is like eggplant parmesan but with cauliflower instead and it's like and it's simple and easier to make and that, and, and that one, I, like, when we made it, I was like, I wish this one was this one. <laughs> and now it's nowhere because it was like in the incentive, but you can, but you can have it. I'll send it to you. If you write me, um, it's like a PDF that I can send out. That sounds amazing. All right. Well, I think we're almost out of time. Zoe, did you want to hop back on for any reason before we say farewell? Hello. Yes. Thank you so much, both of you. Um, I've just been sitting here putting all these tags um, <laughs> in the book. So there's a lot of recipes I'm so excited to try. Um, congratulations. It's such a fantastic book, Janine. We're all really excited to start cooking from it and diving in. Um, and thanks to both of you for being here today. Thanks so much for having us and for everyone who joined. It was so fun and so great to see you, Janine. Thanks for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you for hosting. Thank you all for coming. Absolutely. Yes. And thank you everyone that tuned in. Um, and yes, have a wonderful rest of your evening. We will see you all again very soon. Bye.